In this video, we discuss deduction systems. Rules of deduction will give us the process which will allow us to move from premises to conclusion and is the formal way that we can define proofs in a logical system. We begin with a definition. A deduction is of the form gamma over sigma, and we say if gamma, then sigma, where gamma is a possibly empty list of sequence and sigma is a sequent. We write sigma double line tau and say sigma and tau are equivalent to mean both if sigma then tau and if tau then sigma. And we write simply sigma when gamma is empty and omit the line over it. Then sigma is called a logical axiom. Two, a collection of deductions is called a deduction system. Three, a derivation in a deduction system is a tree such as the following, where each deduction is in the deduction system and there is no infinite ascending chain. This is what is also called a well-founded derivation. However, there may be instances where we may assume the existence of infinite descending chains depending on which fragment of logic we are working in. Four, a deduction system for a theory T will include the logical axioms in the necessary fragment of first order logic as well as the axioms of T. So next we'll give the various deduction system rules that exist in the fragments of first order logic. One, we have structural rules. A, we have the identity axiom where phi entails phi in a context x. B, substitution. If phi entails psi in the context of x, then phi with s substituted for x entails psi with s substituted for x in the context of y, where y is any string of variables containing the variables in the terms of s. C, the cut rule. If phi entailed psi in the context of x and psi entails chi in the context of x, then phi entails chi in the context of x. Two, equality rules. A, variable equality. We have the axiom true entails x equals x in the context of x. B, substitution equality rule. We have the axiom x equals y and phi entails phi with y substituted for x in the context of z, where z is any context containing x, y, and the free variables of phi. Three, finite conjunction. A, true. We have the axiom that phi entails true in the context of x. In other words, true can be thought of as the terminal object if we replace these entailments with arrows. B, conjunction projections. We have the axioms phi and psi entail phi in the context of x, and phi and psi entails psi in the context of x. And these can also be thought of as projections from a product in a category. And C, we have the conjunction universal mapping property, which is not a conventional terminology, but we will use it in this video series. If phi entails psi in the context of x, and phi entails chi in the context of x, then phi entails psi and chi in the context of x. Four, finite disjunction. We have a false, that false entails phi in the context of x. You can think of this as the dual to conjunction, where false in this case is the initial object. B, inclusions. We have the axioms phi entails phi or psi in the context of x, and psi entails phi or psi in the context of x. And C, we have the disjunction universal mapping property as well, where if phi entails chi in the context of x and psi entails chi in the context of x, then phi or psi entails chi in the context of x. Five, implication. We have that phi and psi entails chi in the context of x is equivalent to psi entails phi implies chi in the context of x. And you can think of this as 
the exponential adjoint in the Cartesian closed category. Six, existential quantification. Phi entails psi in the context of x and y is equivalent to there exists y phi entails psi in the context of x. And we have to assume that y is not free in psi. Seven, universal quantification. Phi entails psi in the context of x and y is equivalent to phi entails for all y psi in the context of x where y is not free in phi. Eight, infinitary conjunction. We have the infinite versions of the projection and universal mapping properties that were discussed for the finite conjunction case. And we assume that the index is given by some set. We also have nine infinitary disjunction, which is similar to the finite disjunction case, but with a possibly infinite set i as an index. 10, we have coherent axioms. We have the distributive axiom, phi and psi or chi entails phi and psi or phi and chi in the context of x. We also have the Frobenius axiom, phi and there exists y psi entails there exists y phi and psi in the context of x, where y does not occur in x. These coherent axioms are required if we're working in a fragment of logic, which is weaker than first order, because if we work in the first order set of axioms, then these two conditions can be proven. And 11, we have the classical first order logic axiom, true entails phi or not phi in the context of x. So now we can give the deduction systems for the different fragments of first order logic. For the atomic fragment, we use one and two above. For horn, one, two, and three. Regular, one, two, three, and six. Coherent, one, two, three, four, six, and 10. For first order, one through seven. For classical first order, one through seven and 11. For geometric logic, one through six and nine. For infinitary first order, one through nine.